Since the opening of hostilities within the Battle of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma at midnight on October the 4th, as the tandem anti-satellite and cyber strikes and booting on of locally based electronic warfare assets had wreaked havoc amongst the nation and its defending forces, within the battle at Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, the very same pattern had repeated itself. As the major combat itself within the scope of this battle had begun at 12.30 a.m. with the contact phase being initiated by all of the artillery battalions within the various combined arms brigades, lobbing salvos of both 152 and 155 millimeter howitzer shells, as some of the artillery battalions were comprised with the Type 83 self-propelled 152 millimeter howitzers, whereas others were equipped with the PLZ-05 155 millimeter howitzers, both being highly, vastly destructive weapons. Even artillery from external sources, such as the Long-range 300-millimeter rocket artillery being fired by the 77th Group Army's 77th Artillery Brigade's battalion of A300 long-range rocket systems, as these were the longest-range artillery platform in the world with a 187-mile range. These rockets had wreaked havoc on the Entertainment District as well as in the northwesternmost outer suburbs of the Oklahoma City metro area as they had hit various targets, not only with precision, but with absolute and total devastation, along with the artillery fire raining down upon all of the defending forces. As the battle had initiated, forces from the 118th Combined Arms Brigade, 190th Combined Arms Brigade, as well as even the 53rd Combined Arms Brigade, upon having conducted their flank clearance operations or their first objectives, such as the Tinker Air Force Base, which itself had been under heavy strategic air raids and precision air strikes from JH-7s, as these PLAAF aircraft contributed decisively to the combat unfolding below, the H-20 strategic bomber, which could carry almost three times the payload of the already mammoth H-6K heavy strategic bombers, these had completely flattened much of the installation and continued to rain down destruction upon other portions of the city, which had contained strategic American assets such as critical defense industries or areas containing them. P large portions of the city resembled scenes such as this, where buildings that were on the periphery of the blast radius had collapsed and imploded with their ceilings pancaking in and the roofs and their walls spilling out into the streets as so, whereas other buildings that were being directly hit had chunks of them thrown in all directions as if they weighed nothing as occurred with this building across the street with the back of this building being horribly gutted with the rest of it imminently about to be destroyed by a direct strike from a munition as other buildings were completely gutted and hollowed out with portions of the roof ripped out in the walls where you could see the insides of the building with its floors and more as the rest of this building had collapsed in the street with chunks of it being flown every which way. As these heavy strategic bomber aircraft, such as the H-20 stealth bombers, the H-6K heavy strategic bomber aircraft, and even ground attack aircraft, such as the very powerful JH-7s, with their ability to carry a massive payload for the size of their aircraft, being nearly 20,000 pounds, as the H-6K heavy strategic bomber aircraft, which is a very potent strategic bomber, could carry 34,000 pounds of payload, while the H-20 stealth bomber itself could carry nearly 90,000 pounds of payload. With two H-20s and two H-6Ks being deployed to this particular 
battle space. These had wreaked complete and total havoc on the city below, as various sections of the city now lay in complete and utter total ruination, as even gas mains below had ignited in flames, leaving the rubble in burning ruination throughout the city. As also the JH-7s contributed decisively to combat operations unfolding throughout the city as they conducted precision airstrikes on their targets below. As the ground forces, including the armored forces equipped with the extremely powerful Type 96B main battle tanks and their even more advanced Type 99A counterparts throughout the 58th PLA Group Army, had roamed the city, engaging their targets and assisting in the capture of objectives, including with their anti-tank companies within the armored battalions and armored infantry companies, with their headquarters command and logistical elements supporting them and backing them to the hilt, the mechanized infantry forces were likewise very destructive maneuver elements, as these forces had moved through the city and had cleared various areas of enemy combatants, whether they be armed reactionary civilians, paramilitary SWAT-like elements, or American military elements in the form of the local guard forces. These mechanized infantry elements were another composition of the extremely potent strike forces arrayed against the Americans, fully supported by a network of their very own quadcopter reconnaissance ISR assets at the most local of levels, all the way down to the squad level and up to platoon and company within all of these battalions. With the headquarters battalions of each and every combined arms brigade able to fire volleys of the extremely powerful CH-901A loitering munitions, which also likewise lended their immense support to the ground troops within the scope of these operations. As these forces early on in combat, including even special operations forces that conducted air assault operations into the downtown area, initially on high-value capture operations as well as surgical strike missions against the last remaining firing battery of the 1st of the 160th Field Artillery Battalion within the 45th Combined uh, Infantry Brigade Combat Team. These forces now formed the outer cordons of the western and the eastern pockets as a mechanized infantry battalion and a combat engineer battalion from the 190th had secured a National Guard armory before moving into the downtown area adjacent to the highway networks, as well as a combat engineer battalion, mechanized infantry battalion, and armored battalion from the 118th Combined Arms Brigade moving parallel to I-35 and into the downtown area initially after conducting their flank clearance operations en route, along with an armored battalion that had assisted in the capture and suppression of American forces within the Tinker Air Force Base that had been heavily hit by strategic air raids and tactical airstrikes, as well as tactical ballistic missiles and cruise missile strikes and artillery, which had completely and utterly leveled this base. As these forces now comprised the various sides of the eastern pocket that had developed the Western Pocket was comprised of the companies comprising the 58th Independent Special Operations Battalion flown into different portions of downtown in the western end of downtown, as well as in the middle of downtown, which comprised two companies, the east-facing western side of the Eastern Pocket, and now had surrounded completely the tiny scattered remains of the troops of the 1st of the 160th who had the foresight to go into the city's massive underground areas consisting of various maintenance tunnels, sewers, and B2 level basements of various large buildings that were on the streets above. 
as these forces had done similar to those of the 2nd of the 134th that themselves had disappeared underground the moment the first 152 millimeter artillery shells began to land within the area, conducting precision artillery strikes against their vehicle, motor pools, and bivouac locations, along with tactical ballistic missile strikes on the hotels that many of these troops had been staying in prior to being deployed to their duty assignments, such as protecting the OG&E Frontier Power Plant and possibly the OG&E Mustang Natural Gas Plant, as the details of this were being smoothed out right before the invasion had begun. With the addition of the 300 millimeter long-range rockets from the A300 systems fired by a, an entirely different group army's artillery assets landing in the area, with the 152 artillery shells landing, the area known as the Entertainment District had likewise been completely reduced to complete and total rubbled ruination. As the companies, as the battalion had split in half of the mechanized infantry battalion clearing the flanks in the south central portion of the city before advancing on the 2nd of the 134th, by 6 a.m., the last four companies after the battalion split in half with the other four moving north as these forces were being engaged were now rejoining with the rest of their battalion in the north in the downtown area across the Oklahoma River with conducting this cordon in the west with the comprising companies of the 58th Independent Special Operations Battalion as they had four of their six operator companies surrounding the western pocket as these troops had already by then conducted their high value target capture operations within the area with the other two regular operator companies again along I-235 a spur of 35 facing to the east surrounding along with the other battalions the eastern pocket as the forces ha have now broken down in both pockets into quasi guerrilla type elements the remaining troops of the 700th Brigade Support Battalion that were not forward deployed like the hotel and golf companies with the 1st of the 279th and 1st of the 179th, these remaining forces were logistical elements and had access to stores of ammunition and weaponry that they readily shared with the Western Pocket by going beneath enemy forces through the sewer system and appearing above ground to replenish these forces. As the battles occurring throughout the city lasted different durations of time, and these variations were attributed to many different factors, not the least of which being these areas being viewed by the PLA and CCP regime as how valuable they would be for their colonization operations afterwards versus if they were not valuable. Hence, why some units were destroyed extremely rapidly while others took longer to ferret out and finish off. As within these two pockets, these portions were to comprise the Red Zone, which would be the nucleus of Chinese colonization operations occurring within this area after their victory within the four-day invasion phase. Similar to the Will Rogers International Airport, as this international airport was seen as absolutely vital and to be taken intact as much as possible for the use after the invasion as a megafob for their occupation and colonization operations. The same would be the case for the downtown, as this was seen as the future red zone, and thus would be attempted to be taken as much intact as humanly possible, although portions of it were left in total abject ruination from heavy artillery barrages from the 190th Combined Arms Brigade's Artillery Battalion striking the firing batteries of the 1st to the 160th, besides the one that was guarding the capital complex of the state. The rest had been destroyed in the northern portions of the western downtown area with, the, with this portion of the city in ruins, while this portion, just to its south, was to be taken as much intact as possible. 
this pocket would fall far faster than the eastern pocket as the western pocket would be eventually cut off from the logistical elements within the eastern pocket who were supplying them with ammunition, weapons, food, water, and everything else they needed as the special operations troops of the PLA special operations assets in the area were seen as the best force to deploy underground, although fighting underground would be vastly different than fighting above ground, and as mighty and very extremely powerful as the PLA was, they would lose some of their advantages underground, and the fighting would take on a little bit more of an even tone with American forces that were hiding out within these myriads of maintenance tunnels, B2 level basements, and sewer systems, as the fighting in confined spaces would be drastically different than the fighting going on above ground where the PLA had every advantage over the Americans. Underground, in the sewer systems, they would take perhaps more casualties than they have taken above ground in all other fighting occurrences throughout the battle. As the fighting between the forces of the 1st of the 180th Cav, an element in the previous installment that had chosen, with their commander making the executive decision, their lieutenant colonel staying in their temporary bivouac area until the artillery fire became mere miles from them as it struck the 545th Brigade Engineering Battalion, as well as the HHC, as these forces were being surrounded and destroyed. He then finally, after a period of indecision, made the choice to try to make contact with friendly units, but by which point it was far too late, as three PLA battalions, one armored and two mechanized infantry, with one of the mechanized infantry battalions coming from the 53rd Combined Arms Brigade, while the armored battalion and the other mechanized infantry battalion were of the 93rd. And they had surrounded this force, unbeknownst to them, as they had no ISR assets to speak of by this point. And although these were reconnaissance and target acquisition troops, and this was their orientation as far as being task organized, these Cav Scout elements were essentially useless against the superior firepower of the PLA, as by which point the 40 howitzers of the artillery battalion within the 93rd Combined Arms Brigade had completely shifted their fire against these forces upon them, revealing themselves. As the PLA cyber warfare arm had already ascertained their location through hacking into the financial transaction records between the state and federal level regimes and the owners of the warehouses within which they were bivouacked, they wanted to wait for these units to reveal themselves for their ISR assets to make a visual confirmation before committing vast resources to their destruction. Hence the tactical ballistic missile strikes, retargeting of cruise missile strikes from the YJ-18 slash Club K container-based cruise missile systems, and also the heavy artillery fire that was being lobbed into the area against these forces. All of this combined, along with the ample fire coming from the armored forces, as well as HJ-10 anti-tank missiles fired from the anti-tank company within the armored battalion, and also fire from the mechanized infantry troops would ensure the rapid dismantling and total destruction of this unit as they were the last major combat unit that was still operating as a full battalion within their four comprising companies. Their headquarters company, which is the command and logistical elements and their support elements, and their three companies of Cav Scout forces. Having been fully surrounded before 6 a.m., they had been completely pulverized by artillery and missile fire as the discipline had broken down and without communications due to the local electronic warfare jamming from the electronic warfare battalion within the 58th signal slash EW regiment, these forces had no way to, act, to effectively coordinate their actions or movements and hence were moving in various different directions in platoon-sized elements that were heavily hit and destroyed by the enormous barrage of 40 different howitzers 
honing in all of their fire on these forces, along with the cruise and tactical ballistic missile strikes, and even two small-scale airstrikes from two different J-11 fighters before they had conducted their RTB immediately following back to Mexico, as the fuelers by this point had also headed back due to needing fuel themselves. As these aircraft had been kept in the air for a very long period of time due to the mid-air refueling aircraft, they all now, by which point, had to return, do their RTB for any needed maintenance, have to refuel their aircrafts, and also had to reload them as well with now ground attack munitions for their follow-up operations due to the American Air Force by this point in the invasion having been fully destroyed mostly on the ground but very small amounts as well in the air. After this battalion had been thoroughly destroyed before 6 a.m., the second of the 134th, by which point it also fallen, which was allowing the now divided mechanized infantry company of the PLA from the 53rd Combined Arms Brigade to fully unite as these four companies maneuvered north and assisted in the cordon that had formed around these American forces of reactionary armed civilians, now numbering under 200, under 300, alphabet paramilitary SWAT-like elements, and also the remaining troops that were scattered and leaderless mostly of the 1st of the 160th Artillery Battalion, which had been thoroughly annihilated by counter-battery fire and also the withering firepower of the special operating companies in the area who had FPV drones, armed robots, and 82 millimeter mortars, as well as the firepower coming from the fire support company within the mechanized infantry battalion, firing their PLL-05 heavy assault gun mortars, as well as their 130 millimeter light artillery multiple launch type 63 rocket artillery systems, which were short range light artillery rockets, which could be quickly reloaded and fired in large quantities. These forces were now under withering firepower, and the special operations companies that had separated these pockets were now to be tasked with interdicting and by going underground between the pockets to stop the flow of logistics from the remains of the 700th Brigade Support Battalion into the western pocket to supply what was left of these troops by between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., hours and hours later, this western pocket would finally fall, running out of ammunition with the survivors surrendering to the PLA. With the last fighting of the major combat operations within this battle occurring between 9 p.m. and 12 a.m. on day two of the invasion, with very tiny amounts of residual fighting on day two as Hidden forces that had hidden throughout the first day would reveal themselves and attempt their own small-scale ambushes only to be brutally crushed by the 58th PLA Group Army and its remaining forces before the 10th PLA Group Army of external invasion prong Group Army 7 through 13 shedding the 10th Group Army to relieve the 58th to then move up I-44 to Cushing and onward to Tulsa to capture Tulsa, with the 10th taking their place in the then-conquered Oklahoma City, Oklahoma area, thereby relieving them as the rest of the group armies, 7 through 13, move north, minus the 10th that would be left in this area on day two when they would be moving through this particular region. The final major fighting... In the downtown area, by the time the Western Pocket fell at 9 p.m., as special operators went into the sewers and maintenance tunnels and basement level two beneath large high-rise buildings in the downtown area to interdict supplies and personnel, the fighting in the downtown area would increasingly be squeezed into a one-by-one-mile pocket as methodically the troops of these battalions committed. There were five battalions committed just between the 190th and 118th, between the mechanized infantry combat engineers from the 190th, 
armored mechanized infantry and combat engineers of the 118th and then the armored battalion moving on early on in the battle from the 53rd plus the two special operations companies that were facing east on the western end of the cordon all surrounding this area and increasingly pressing inward as they methodically fought over every street corner and every nook and cranny of every building and now we're fighting underground as well, with the special operators being the ideal forces for the battle underground. And again, although they would lose many of their advantages underground that they had above ground, they would eventually prevail, although they would take more casualties underground than they ever did above ground in all of the fighting throughout the battle up to this point. Going to the map of the local area, this is a one by a one mile area of downtown. The Joint Forces Headquarters of the Oklahoma National Guard had been surgically hit by two YJ-18C container-based cruise missiles that had been set to target the structure, destroying it completely while gutting buildings across the street from it, including completely destroying a toll building for this large urban parking lot here that had been within the blast radius, as well as gutting a portion of this hospital right here, this corner of which was facing diagonally from this building that had been hit by the two cruise missiles and was now a smoldering crater of ruins. As the forces on this map of the PLA in, in immediate view consisted of a company of combat engineers with their platoons already dismounted. This platoon had their troops dismounted in this mega church parking lot right here. This one platoon, which consisted of five squads. Then there was a platoon. I'm sorry, this platoon came from this group of vehicles right here dismounted. This platoon came from this platoon group of platoon vehicles right here and had taken this high-rise apartment building with two squads of it on the top floor and more squads inside of the building itself with over here another dismounted platoon from this platoon's vehicles consisting of five squads with one moving down between these buildings in a rolling T formation and two squads entering this building to clear it and two more entering this building to clear it with one squad coming out on the roof access to take position on the roofs as they had been doing this exact thing with every single solitary downtown building they encountered that had multiple floors. They would get on the roofs of these buildings and provide overwatch for their troops moving across the street on the ground as this was the most tactically efficient way to provide adequate fire support for their forces on the ground there were two squads of mechanized infantry right here as this was a mechanized infantry company's combat elements leaving the headquarters platoon off map as had been the case with this combat engineer company leaving their headquarters platoon off map which was the command and logistical elements of the company with these being its combat elements of the combat engineers and these being the combat elements of the mechanized infantry here as this dismounted platoon of mechanized infantry was storming this building here along with these two squads here and this squad over here moving down the middle of this rubbled ruined group of two buildings in between the crater that used to be the joint forces headquarters with this platoon with with no dismounts vi visible moving down the street here what happens essentially is one squad goes upon the roof access to this building as two had moved in here while another two had stayed or i'm sorry two had moved into this building one went to the roof access when two squads went into this building one was on the roof access facing down while the other squad of the two that cleared these two buildings moves across the street and into the hospital through the rubbled ruins right here that used to be its wall on this corner that had been badly 
damaged by the cruise missile strikes into the Joint Forces headquarters of the National Guard. With this squad on the flanks moving through this area and bounding across the street to this rubble pile that was a toll building for this urban parking lot. Supporting all of this movement as these vehicles are slowly moving into the area over here that have no dismounted troops as of this time they're moving, supporting them are CH-901A loitering munitions throughout this one-by-one one mile downtown segment as these have been armed with HE warheads because there are MRAPs, Max Pro MRAPs, with their crew serve weapons that are being operated by the remaining surviving troops of the 700th Brigade Support Battalion. Another factor in this battle in this downtown area is the barricades that had been created throughout the course of the fighting over the many hours that had been unfolding throughout downtown in general as the pocket got more and more condensed and squeezed these forces had taken time to dig in in certain areas and create foxholes and machine gun nests, and they rolled a lot of abandoned vehicles together and created these barricades with abandoned vehicles, which were manned by different types of personnel. As the military forces had deteriorated into a quasi or quasi guerrilla type element, they now manned these structures that were created out of these now abandoned vehicles that had been rolled all together to create barricades, which would slow down, although not stop, the enemy, as they were only intended to slow them down long enough for f defense forces to be able to adequately pour down fire upon them. Although the roofs of these buildings for the defenders became a very hazardous place indeed to be, be upon, as the parameters of the AI targeting mode for these weapons was not just oriented for attacking the Max Pro MRAPs, but also for attacking personnel that were on the building tops, as they were seen as a high threat within the threat matrix that had been part of the programming of the AI. As, with on, as upon the buildings themselves, these forces could throw Molotov cocktails or even fire AT-4 anti-armor recoilless shell systems, which were 84 millimeter recoilless shells. They were not rockets in the sense of like an RPG, but they were a one-time use recoil a shell that was 84 millimeters and was relatively destructive against light armored vehicles. Though it could do very little to a Type 88C, Type 96B, or Type 99A, it could definitely damage or destroy a Type 89A armor personnel carrier, especially when being fired from a building down upon the roof of such a vehicle. It could definitely penetrate the roof of an armor personnel carrier and eliminate those inside of it from that type of an angle, being fired from on higher elevation or roofing. Hence the need for these Elements that had taken to the rooftops of various buildings, even a parking garage right here. As you see the little corkscrew that leads to the top floors of the garage for the cars to drive down and out of the parking garage. These Max Pro MRAPs could get to the top as the clearance, the roof clearance for these vehicles were just enough to where they could actually go into the garage and go up this corkscrew ramp to the very top of it. And they could aim their M250 cal machine guns and, man and watch these streets at these intersections. Across the street from here, there were 80 armed civilians inside of this apartment complex building, this high-rise apartment. Within this high-rise apartment, there were no armed civilians except for those. There was a group of five of them that curved around the side of this building facing the northwest. 
And as the combat engineer dismounts here, had cleared these buildings, sent a squad each to the roof, while one, while the middle squad moving down in a rolling T had stopped and basically watched their sector of fire and watched these buildings to make sure there were no enemies in the buildings to cover these other squads moving into the area. This squad had basically taken a little bit of fire from around the corner of this building, but returned fire and wiped out these armed civilians while the vehicle-based fire, as these vehicles moved up, could get the rest, as they were now within a good striking angle to tear up the rest of them with the lead vehicle of these combat engineer platoons, which were a... VN-20 infantry fighting vehicle. They also had a GCZ-112 armored engineering vehicle, and they had three armored personnel carriers. They were configured nearly identical to a mechanized infantry platoon, apart from the fact that instead of an additional APC, they had their armored engineering vehicle in, in lieu of that. In some ways, they were even more potent than a standard mechanized infantry formation as their armored engineering vehicle could also fire a rocket-fired line charge to clear mines, obstacles, or even enemy forces. And these would be used against the barricades as these combat engineers proved to be ideal forces for attacking fortified positions as that was what they were made to do, among other things. They were made to recon enemy areas. They were made to destroy enemy fortifications, including even minefields, to clear the way for other maneuver elements. And they were more than capable of being in direct combat as they were equipped with the same volume of firepower that were mechanized infantry troops. As these forces gradually moved down the street, so many things were happening at about the same time on this map, including the movements that were all coordinated by radio and ISR assets of these forces. This combat engineering company in this map segment, this one mile by one mile map segment, was part of the 190th Combined Arms Brigade from their combat engineer battalion which had more combat engineer companies besides just this one, but this was just the one that was tasked with finishing the clearance of this last portion of downtown that was held by the Americans. Certain streets were barricaded throughout, including here, here, and here. Also, here, here, here and here and here, as well as here. These formed the last areas that were held by the American forces, consisting of a hodgepodge of paramilitary elements from the alphabet forces. The remaining last companies of the 700th Brigade Support Battalion of which the Golf and Hotel companies were not present as they were forward deployed with the 1st of the 279th and 1st of the 179th, but the remaining companies, including the headquarters elements, were within this area and even underground as well in the sewers and maintenance tunnels and basement level twos of some of these high-rise buildings and also armed reactionary civilians. As... There were 90 paramilitary elements within this large office building right here. They even had some of their offices within this building across diagonally from the parking garage. And there were 80 armed civilians again in this high rise. And there were 20 armed reactionary civilians in this building right here within this plaza, which was two office buildings, and would be joined by nine additional. This says 20 civilians plus nine as more are moving into this area from the survivors of this group running between these four buildings right here through this alleyway, as some of them would be KIA'd by these 
PLA troops on the roof exchanging fire back and forth with them as they tried to run through the area, with these guys being wiped out by these on the roof firing down and upon them, with the rest making it into this building between these barricaded streets before moving into this building with these 20 other armed civilian combatants. And then there's five, there's five additional on the roof of this building, as depicted here. Again, there's many actions occurring concurrently and also some at different times throughout this map. Over here is another urban parking lot. And here is the city park in this specific area that had been dug in with a trench system and two foxholes for machine gun nests with the parking lot for this urban park occupied by three of four vehicles of this platoon with the other vehicle facing this street to man this sector of fire along with the machine gun nest holding down this park in this street right here with the trench system able to watch a wide array of areas like this barricade to the direct east and also to the northeast as well as manning the sector of fire down the street with this MRAP. They had tactically established themselves fairly well and this foxhole could watch this alleyway between these buildings so there's a diagonal street right here with this machine gun nest having an intersecting field of fire with this trench system here able to watch directly to the east as some of the last moves in this battle would be a tank company's tank platoons moving into this area three out of four of them with the with another off map and the headquarters platoon although this was not occurring yet as this would occur around midnight when this area was finally captured which would end officially day one of the invasion as day two would just be tiny residual combat throughout the city as some armed reactionary civilians would just begin emerging and attempting to fight back but would be brutally suppressed and crushed like those before them on day one. As these forces were now here in this area and could see down this alleyway and they could watch ahead while the other forces were had moved into the hospital while these troops on the roof exchanged fire back and forth with these armed reactionary civilians, this squad then, after entering, had gone up to the top floor of this building as this squad had moved here first and had engaged they they had not been seen because these vehicles came through and wiped these guys out right away and then they threw grenades over here and blasted these guys along with vehicle based fire coming from this vn20 moving into the area as these forces were exchanging fire with them but they all failed as they lacked heavy weapons with which to deal adequately with such a powerful vehicle as this vehicle was extremely heavily armored and even had additional armor plating on it from their ERA kits and completely wiped these guys out with the assistance of this dismounted squad of mechanized infantry before they too went into this building and then cleared the bottom floors of it before exchanging fire with these guys on top of the parking garage and when these guys came up, they helped finish off the guys on the roof with this group firing over here, before then reorienting all their fire against the guys on the parking garage. Now, when this squad was firing from within this building, they were being fired back on, which is why there's green right here along this building. As these guys on the roof gave them covering fire, they then bounded quickly across the street and into the parking garage. As that was occurring, these loitering munitions had moved into the area including these as well and these two here in particular hit and destroyed these max pro m wraps which is why they're surrounded in red they're destroyed and then these guys on the roof are eventually wiped out by these guys and a loitering munition with the squad that went into the bottom levels of the parking garage beginning to go through there and starting to engage 50 troops in a firefight which takes 
a substantial amount of time as they're outnumbered at the time, but more troops would be joining them as originally three squads went here and one went in this building with another one moving this way and another moving this way to the street corner after having laid down suppressing fire on it. They tactically bounded and covered. They went first and they went ahead and then they moved here <clears throat> before moving into the garage to help these forces. Again, there's a lot of things happening at all at one time on this map. Loitering munition had come down and struck this Max Pro MRAP, destroying it, holding the others up, from which they too were hit by loitering munitions moving into the area, destroying this entire platoon of vehicles trying to move up up this diagonal street to assist their forces in the garage and on the rooftop of this building. As this squad had entered this building and begun clearing the floors of it before emerging on the roof, as this loitering munition had come in and hit the guys on the roof, allowing them to reorient and shift their fire down and into this machine gun nest, this foxhole down here. As these vehicles were now moving into place, they one had been lost, an armor personnel carrier moving into this area right here, as early on it had been hit by Molotov attacks. And the crew had bailed out alive, as by then all of these guys had been wiped out, as the drop had been gotten on this vehicle. As the rubble had concealed a few men with the Molotovs, it heaved them at this vehicle, catching the vehicle on fire as the flaming contents had seeped into the engine block and began to catch the hoses and other flammables on fire. But as the crew bailed out to the other vehicles, they had been safe as the return fire was very heavy on the two survivors of this group. With the other vehicles then fanning out to pull security first around this vehicle, allowing it to burn out, allowing the ammo to cook off, which was, which was safe as it was not pressurized enough like when fired through a barrel of a weapon to be of any really major threat while still inside the vehicle. Although it would be dangerous to dismount, but the, everybody stayed within their vehicles as they pulled security. And they had begun initially taking heavy fire from enemies on the other side of this barricade, enemy troops and armed reactionary civilians, along with the troops manning the machine gun nest, firing through a slit in the barricades at these vehicles. But they returned very heavy fire on these forces, with their VN-20 infantry fighting vehicle with its 30mm autocannon, 100mm main gun, 762x54mm turret-based coaxial weapon, as well as the heavy 12.7mm machine gun fire, which utterly shredded these forces up along with the guys on the roof firing down at them. They completely eliminated them. It was a complete and total tactical success besides losing one vehicle up here early on along with the loitering munitions strike on these guys. Now, as the other squad that had gone into the parking garage to help this squad had been viciously fighting 50 different troops on the di spread throughout the different floors of the parking garage, they had eliminated roughly a squad at a time on each level before finally working their way up to the top and finishing off the last of these guys as loitering munitions had struck these vehicles and badly maimed a few of the men on the end before they had been finished off as these troops went up the corkscrew ramp to the top floor and wiped them out from the back before then preparing to bound across the way as these vehicles now continued to move up and were laying heavy volumes of fire from their VN-20 on this barricade and the men that were manning it, these armed civilians. Now there would be two squads bounding into this building, along with the squad of combat engineers that had gone from the bottom floor as the troops on the top floor watched over them, clearing this building here, with them then going on the upper floor before this squad from this building clearance with the squad watching over them and cleared this building, moved into this building, and then went around into this building, would now be assaulting this building with these two squads from the parking garage. This was all very methodical, and it was all very difficult and arduous work. Even with the assistance of loitering munition strikes, it was all very difficult. 
As these vehicles now had been moving up, they had eliminated armed civilians in this area as they too were moving at the same time as these vehicles were moving and these vehicles were moving. And now they had moved here with their five squads moving from this mega church parking lot into this building right here. All of them, rolling T's, wedge formations, line formation in the middle, rolling T and wedge, they all five went into this building to clear it before five then moved into this building. After this group of armed reactionary civilians had moved through this area and then into this building to escape the combat engineers moving through here and the vehicles now moving down the street. As one squad would get to the roof of this building to overwatch for their other four squads going into this office building, <clears throat> the vehicles had now made it here and were now beginning to move up a little bit further, engaging this barricade and those manning it, causing them and the civilians that went in this building to flee together into this building here, as the four squads were now busy clearing this building adjacent to the group that was out here. They were about to be hit by the, pl the plastic explosive line charge, rocket-guided line charge, as the lead infantry fighting vehicle would pull off onto the curb and allow the combat engineering vehicle to move up and fire their charge over this barricade to blast it into oblivion as these forces had moved into position here. This battle will be continued within the next video, which will be the last video of this series as not only is this occurring, but at the same exact time as this is occurring, there is combat occurring within the sewer maintenance tunnel in basement level 2 of this particular part of the city where the last holdouts are trying to fight for their lives in terms of the defenders trying to hold out within this one by one mile segment of the downtown area as within the sewers and maintenance tunnels and basement level twos the chinese special forces had now emerged into these maintenance areas that connected to the sewers and the basement level twos which constituted a labyrinth beneath the city in and of itself and the fighting under the city would be just as severe as the fighting above ground. All of this to be explored in the last video of the series of this heavy battle that's winding up in downtown Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The last fighting in terms of major combat operations to unfold throughout the entire metro area itself to be explored in the next video.